our next speaker. Um, he is Professor Gordon Locke, uh, Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, a professor at the University of uh, Zagreb, but also Honorable Professor at the University of Edinburgh and King's College London. Um, his uh, talk will have a very enigmatic title, Glycans, who would have thought? So thank you for the introduction. I hope you can all hear me. So I am very, very sorry that I cannot be there in person. I was planning to come. I was looking forward to come. But then before traveling to the cold and missed to Scotland, I decided to spend a few weeks, a few days of holidays in one of the most beautiful coastlines in the world, the Montenegro coast, which is nearly as beautiful as the Croatian coast where I come from. But the key difference is that the Croatia is listed green in UK, while the Montenegro was moved to the red list while I was there, which means that I cannot travel to UK despite the fact that I'm fully vaccinated, that I even recovered from COVID in the past, but I simply cannot travel. And considering the, the level of infection in Scotland, which is higher than Montenegro, this is a little bit odd. But actually, in this pandemic, so many decisions we made were, were odd. And one of the big reasons why we failed so heavily is that medicine is still treating everybody as equal. So when a patient comes to a physician, he is a homo sapiens, equal to anybody else. And we know that this is not the case, but we are lacking the, the biomarkers. We are lacking the tools to know the difference between people. And actually, the first biomarker which has been implemented in the personalized medicine are glycans, the blood groups. Blood groups are chemically glycans, and when we see a patient who needs transfusion, we do a test, we see which kind of glycans they have, and then based on that, we choose the therapy. But not only blood groups. Uh, glycans are everywhere. Glycans are the ultimate layer of molecular complexity. But in the same time, they're the most neglected molecules of cellular communication. And this became very evident in this pandemic when even the director of NIH on the figure on the left-hand side was showing the, the S-glycoprotein without a single glycan in its structure. Well, actually, the S-glycoprotein looks like a figure in the middle with a more glycan than peptide on its surface. And these glycans are not only decorations, they're actively participating in keeping the RGB part of the S-glycoprotein open in interacting with the receptors, and actually they are integral part of the molecule. And this is not only S-glycoprotein, the majority of proteins are glycosylated. And to understand biology, to see the complete picture, we have to include glycans in what we are doing. And here I have to stress that the glycans I will be talking about have nothing to do with the glycation, with a chemical reaction between glucose and proteins, which we mostly measure as HbA1c. This is something completely different. Glycans I will be talking about are elaborated post-translational modifications which are being added to proteins. And not many people study glycans because they're complicated. They're branched not easy to measure, many chemical steps are needed to be able to detect the glycans and measure them in a lab. And actually in a high throughput manner, this is very difficult. And people generally don't do it, but the fact that something is difficult does not justify not doing it. And more and more people realize this, and now even the NIH through its Office for Strategic Coordination of the Institutes launched the special funding mechanism to develop methods for glycoscience, and I hope we will be seeing more and more data about glycans in the future. We went first in that direction. We started high throughput glycomics over 10 years ago. We analyzed over 150,000 different people from some of the best phenotype and genotype cohorts in Europe, US, and China. We did it in a collaboration with many leading researchers, which is enabling us to uh, bring glycomics to the same level as other omics and merge this data and look at the data as integral information. So something which I would like you to think about is that alternative glycosylation, meaning adding a different glycan structures to a specific glycosylation site on a protein, 
is functionally very similar to coding mutation. So coding mutation is a change in DNA, which causes a protein to have a different amino acid sequence, to have a different structure and have a different function. We know that a single coding mutation could be lethal. The same thing is for glycosylation. Adding a different glycon structure on a given glycosylation site causes a protein to have a different structure, to have a different function, and can be very important for health and disease. But contrary to mutations which are inherited in the Mendelian way, glycon structures are inherited as a complex trait. So there are multiple genetic loci which integrate the information into the final structure. But despite the fact that this, uh, can I have the next slide? Despite the fact that this um, is not directly encoded in a genome, glycon structures are still significantly heritable. In the large studies we did mostly together with the Tim Spector, we showed that glycon is between 50 to 70% heritable, despite the abs absence of a genetic template. And this was very clearly shown in a study we did on mice, where we have studied over 100 different strains of mouse cousins, which were generated by Prof. Uh, Grant Morahan in Western Australia. And with only three generations of uh, shift uh, reshuffling alleles, these mice became so different in their structure and function of immunoglobulins that we can easily classify them just based on their IgG glycon structure. But this has a very complex regulation. Through a series of genome-wide association studies we did in collaboration with many people, including the team from Edinburgh and, and uh, London, we have shown that for immunoglobulin G, the structure of a glycon is affected by at least 40 different genes. So 40 different genes work together to uh, produce a glycon structure, which will be part of immunoglobulins, which will determine the immunoglobulin function. And some of these genes are effectors. They put different glycons, but majority of genes are regulatory genes. They in some way regulate the activity of the effector genes and decide how to glycosylate a given immunoglobulin in a given person. And in addition to polymorphisms in all these 40 plus genes, there is epigenetic regulation of all of these genes, which also has an important role, as well as direct environmental factors, which also act on glycosylation. So the given glycon structure integrates genetic information, epigenetic information, and environmental factors into chemical structure. And these genes, which are important for IgG glycosylation, are in the same time known factors for numerous different diseases and traits. For example, when we looked at the pleiotropy for these, uh, at that time, a little bit less than 40 genes, we found 94 different phenotypes where there is a pleiotropy, meaning the same polymorphism is changing IgG glycosylation and is also affecting risk for some diseases which we would expect, like type 1 diabetes, uh, lupus, uh, prone disease, where we know antibodies have a role, but also for some things where we would not expect immunoglobulin glycans to be important, like cholesterol level or dementia or Parkinson's disease. So these genes which regulate IgG glycosylation are known risk factors for numerous different diseases. And from a number of studies which have been done by other people, because you know today uh, immunoglobulins are uh, eight out of the 10 best-selling drugs in the world, so many people work on immunoglobulin function. We know that glycans and immunoglobulins are functional effectors which have multiple roles in balancing information. So there are some glycans which would make immunoglobulin more pro-inflammatory, while there are some glycans which would actually convert the function of immunoglobulins and make it anti-inflammatory. So immunoglobulins with the highly silylated glycans are actually suppressing inflammation, not promoting inflammation. And the immunology field is becoming more and more aware of this. And for example, our recent review was the second most downloaded and the third most cited paper in serology in the last two years. So what we have learned by studying large human cohorts? First thing what we learned 
is that immunoglobulin glycans change a lot with age. So when we are young, we have more glycans which suppress inflammation. As and we are getting older, there are more and more glycans which promote inflammation. And actually, based on this knowledge, we developed something which is now called the glycan age test. Here I have to disclose that this is uh, now a commercial company. I'm one of the founders. I also inventor on the key patents for this uh, invention. And I'm clearly in a conflict of interest here. So I will try to present only data and let you make the conclusions. So what we know about glycans, they integrate genetic, epigenetic, and environmental factors into this index, which can be reliably quantified. And we know that these glycans are functional effectors. They regulate inflammation. They either promote or suppress inflammation. And in this way, through either promoting or suppressing low-grade chronic inflammation, they contribute to development of many diseases. And can I have the next slide, please? And we have multiple papers in this field, over 100, probably over 150 publications so far, some of them in the leading journals, including circulation, gastroenterology, several other nature journals. So despite the fact that I'm being in a conflict of interest here, I think I can present some reliable data which have been independently reviewed. And what we have learned is that these changes which we see in the IgG glycome in aging also happen in many different diseases. So what we have here on this slide, the last four bars are just effects of age. So comparing old and young individuals in several cohorts. And the other bars are effects of different diseases. So people having uh, uh, lupus, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, diabetes, uh, even colorectal cancer. So people with different diseases change their glycon in a similar way as what happens in aging. And in many cases, in actually in most cases where we have looked, we see the changes in glycans before the disease is even diagnosed. So these changes in glycans is something what happens before the disease develops. And I will present you here an example of cardiovascular diseases, where we first did a large uh, cohort studies, over 3,000 people together with the Tim Spector in, in London and Jim Wilson here in Edinburgh. And we found that the composition of the IgG glycom strongly associates with the cardiovascular disease risk score. So the risk of developing cardiovascular diseases in the future. And based on this initial data, we managed to persuade the people holding the samples from the EPI cohort to send us their samples. And the EPIC was collected approximately 30 years ago, and there was a 15 years of uh, follow-up after the samples were collected. So we had practically a prospective study in a fridge. And when we looked at IgG glycans as predictor of cardiovascular events, so the future either heart attack or stroke, only glycans attached to immunoglobulin. So the molecules we can easily quantify were equally predictive for uh, cardiovascular events in men. And just a single out of these glycans on IgG plus age was more predictive than the entire AHA score in women. So obviously, glycans today can predict whether somebody will have a heart attack or stroke in the future. But is it causal? How, how does these glycans and immunoglobulins associate with the future cardiovascular events? Recently, we were able to show in a large study where we had uh, 2,000 twins followed for 15 years with the three sampling that glycans today predict hypertension in the future, and we managed to replicate this in another cohort in Germany. So apparently, glycans today are predictive of future hypertension. And then we found that there is a researcher in US who for quite some time studies the role of immunoglobulin glycans as an inducers of obesity induced hypertension in mice. So he published several papers. There are also independent uh, replication from another group published earlier this year, which suggests that indeed these pro-inflammatory hypocellulated immunoglobulin glycans induce hypertension, at least in mice, in obese mice, by binding to the FC gamma receptor 2B and acting through the endothelial cells. So we teamed up 
with uh, Phil, and we did a large study together when, where he was trying to improve IgG glycosylation by a dietary supplement called MANAC, which is N-acetylmanosamine, which is a precursor of salic acid. So when you feed obese mice with the MANAC, they do not develop this um, pro-inflammatory IgG glycum. So normally, if you put the mouse on a high-fat diet, the mouse becomes obese and loses cellulation of their immunoglobulins, and this promotes uh, hypertension. Well, when mice were supplemented with the MANAC, they did become obese, but their immunoglobulins did not lose salic acid, so the cellulation level was normal, and these mice did not develop hypertension. So this is a pretty strong indication that this um, hypocellulation of IgG, which in mice is caused by obesity, does promote development of hypertension. And what we did, we looked at the huge human cohorts. We didn't have intervention studies, so we just looked at correlations. And we found that the hypocellulation associates with a higher blood pressure. And this was published in, published in circulation two years ago. And interestingly, this change in IgG glycosylation in humans, actually in females, strongly associates with the perimenopause period. While men are generally, their, their immunoglobulin glycans are generally aging more or less linearly, in women, usually IgG glycum is more um, anti-inflammatory in the premenopause period, and then in the perimenopause, it quickly accelerates. And this can be extremely drastic. For example, we see many, these are the clients of the glycan age, who would have a very good glycan age for years, and then in the perimenopause period, they would age for 20 or 30 years within a couple of months. And I will come back to that later in my speak. But here, before that, I will tell you another part where glycans are important, and this is diabetes. There are multiple lines of evidence generated by other people showing that glycans are actually, actually active participants in the development of diabetes. So we looked in the large population cohorts, and we found that indeed there is a signature of diabetes, a signature of diabetes in glycans. So glycans are predictive of diabetes, but also we see that, and this is on the right-hand uh, sidebar from the Finneris cohort, that this signature is visible even before the diabetes was diagnosed. So then we went back to this um, EPIC cohort, and there was a subset of people who developed diabetes after sampling, approximately 740 of them in the German subset of the, the EPIC cohort. We analyzed glycans, and we found that glycans uh, plasma glycans, they're not immunoglobulin glycans, but glycans attached to all plasma proteins, are also highly predictive of future diabetes development, actually even more predictive than the German diabetes risk score. And recently, we managed to replicate this in these 2000 twins where we were looking, analyzing glycans in three time points. And this unique setting of having people analyzed in multiple time points over a long period of time enabled us to answer one of the key questions is, which questions which we had. And the question was, is the change in glycan something like a risk factor, a predisposition for diabetes, or are the changes in glycan something which happens with the progression from normal to diabetes stage? And apparently it is the second. So glycans are starting to change even 10 years before people develop diabetes. They change gradually to the diabetic level. And then when people are diagnosed with diabetes, usually they're already, the glycans are changed a lot. But here we have to remember that diabetes is not a single disease. There are several multiple molecular pathways which lead to the loss of glycemic control. And it does seem that glycans are particularly associated with one of them. And this is a potential, this is not a formal subtype of diabetes, but this is potentially a subtype of diabetes, which develops in a people who will develop hyperglycemia in acute disease. So we know that some people 
in acute infection will develop hyperglycemia. We know that this is a known risk factor for diabetes in the future. And if we look at glycans, we can practically with nearly perfect precision in a steady state predict who will develop hyperglycemia in acute disease and who will not. So to summarize this uh, diabetes part, we have this the diabetes test, which is still not commercially available. This is just a research tool at the moment where we see uh, changes several years before any other symptoms before any blood glucose is altered, before HbA1c is altered. And apparently, a subgroup of patients have this risk factor, so not everybody. And these altered glycans are not only a biomarker, but they are active effector in disease development. And we are currently doing a number of different clinical trials trying to see whether this risk is preventable, meaning if by lifestyle and pharmacological interventions, we change glycans, Will these changes in glycans also associate with the decreased risk of disease? And diabetes is one of the examples. We see in many diseases that glycans are altered and that they change before disease develops. And some kind of a big picture general idea is that we want to identify people who will develop disease in the future. Because what is a disease? Disease is a name which is given to a, a specific set of symptoms and a location of symptoms. So if you come with the pain and inflammation in your joints, it's arthritis. If it's in your bowel, it's a Crohn's disease or IBD or whatever. And usually these diseases are beyond the point of no return. So once you get the label of one of those chronic diseases, it's very hard to go back. But if we identify a problem before disease symptoms manifest, before disease develops, only when the molecules driving the disease are altered, and we know that these glycans are one of those molecules which contribute to disease development, then maybe by early either pharmacological or a lifestyle intervention, we can revert these bad molecules and prevent disease from developing. So the key question I would like to ask today is, can we revert the glycan age clock or biological age? Can we stop inflammation? Can we prevent development of diseases where inflammation is an important element. There is a lot of anecdotal evidence that this can be done. We collaborate with many anti-aging uh, physicians who would take a patient, start treating them, and we normally see that their glycan age can improve a lot, even for decades in a couple of uh, months or in a year. But this is anecdotal. But more and more anecdotal evidence is slowly forming into a hard evidence. For example, I believe most of you listened to the Tim Spector talking two days ago. We collaborate with Tim for over a decade now. We analyzed over 20,000 of his twins, including his samples. And his glycan age was good, but then at one point it got worse. And since Tim knows that this is a risk for many different diseases, he tried to do something, and actually he managed to decrease his glycan age in el for 11 years in a couple of months. So things are doable. If you want to ask Tim what he did, you know, there is an Instagram talk where he and I chatted about it. I will not disclose what he was doing. But what we are doing, we are trying to do more research to identify things which really work. And to be sure that something works, we need a properly designed placebo-controlled randomized trial. And one of the very hot topics in the, in the anti-aging field is the hormone optimization. And we managed to get samples from one really well-designed study where uh, menopause was induced chemically. So young women were treated with inhibitors of gonadal hormones. And then part of the group had their uh, estrogen uh, through the estrogen patch. So they had a normal level of estrogen, while the other group, part of the group received placebo. And what we have seen in the placebo group, glycan age increased for approximately, for an average, nine years within six months. In the estrogen supplementation group, this did not happen. And then after the recovery period, the, both groups returned to the normal levels. The similar situation was observed with the men, where testosterone supplementation did prevent increase in glycans, but 
This did not work if the conversion of testosterone to estrogen was blocked by the aromatase inhibitors. So both in women and men, it is actually estrogen which is regulating IgG glycosylation. Hormone intervention is too aggressive for some people, but there are some things which also work which are not too aggressive. One is the weight loss. We did several cohorts of people undergoing bariatric surgery, and we have shown that there are significant changes in the IgG glycom. It's rejuvenating after the significant weight loss caused by the bariatric surgery. One patient improved even for 37 glycan age years and six months. Again, bariatric surgery may be too drastic for some people. So we looked at the regular weight loss. Again, the same 2000 twins which were tracked for 15 years. Some of them were gaining weight. Some of them were losing weight. And people who were gaining weight were actually increasing in their glycan age and in these pro-inflammatory glycans faster than twins who were losing age. So regular weight loss also helps in uh, improving their IgG glycan. But apparently there is no magic diet. We looked at the Diogenes study, which is a large European project where 1,000 people were fed five different diets for a year. And in each of the diets, we have seen some people significantly improving and some people significantly decreasing the quality of their IgG glycom. And, and the, the extent of changes was much larger than what we normally see in people without any intervention. So apparently, there is no magic diet but different diets can help different people. And this is something what we know people are different, so we cannot expect everybody to react to the same food in the same way. The same goes for exercise. Uh, we were uh, brainwashed by the, by the food industry saying that if you eat too much, you just have to sweat it out and then enough gym will solve all problems. This is false. Uh, you cannot sweat out what you eat too much. And we see that people who overexercise, who overtrain, generally turn out bad on this glycan age index. While, for example, uh, the high intensity interval training, when the training was balanced with a, with a recovery, then the results were much better. Another very important thing for the glycom is the microbiome. In the several papers, we have shown that, uh, for example, um, uh, fecal microbiome transplant significantly alters the glycans and glycans and the microbes cross talk on a number of levels. And actually this might be one of the ways how ultra processed food also alters the IgG glycom. Uh, there are many, many examples about the importance of glycans in diseases. We recently, actually a couple of months ago, published a very comprehensive uh, review with over 500 references. Uh, the book is extremely expensive. It's over three and a half thousand euros, but our chapter is freely available at this um, address in the bottom left corner. So if you're interested, feel free to download. So to close my talk, I think that something what we are all trying to do we are trying to help people live healthier lives and prevent diseases. And the problem is that despite the fact that we know what we should be doing, the majority of people don't do it. And they don't do it because it is difficult. It is difficult to make a hard choice or a hard step now and then have a benefit in two or three decades. For example, for me, if I see a cookie, I will eat it despite the fact that I know this is not healthy for me, but you know, the, the, the bill will come in a few decades so I can eat this cookie. But if there would be a tool which can, in a reasonable time frame, measure the effects of our lifestyle and give us objective insight into the current state of this low-grade chronic inflammation which we have, and in the same time help us to see whether what we are trying to do is actually helping, I think this can motivate people and this can help us all to live healthier and longer. And this tool is available. As I said, it's, I'm in conflict of interest. You have to judge whether it's usable or not, but it is available. There is even a discount code for the conference. There is a small booth 
somewhere in the, the exhibitor section. I don't know where because I'm not in Edinburgh. So please visit them and see whether they can be of any help. And at the very end, I have to acknowledge that there are many people in the lab working to enable all this science to happen and that we have very generous funding. We got over 50 million euros to study all these changes in glycans and we are extremely collaborative. So if you're involved in an interesting study, have some samples in the fridge, get in touch. Maybe we can analyze glycans for you. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this inspiring speech. Um, if you are available, uh, dear professor, uh, we would be very happy to welcome you also during our question and answer session that will follow after the last uh, 